under the form, for instance, of a controversial global warming? And if it's not a belief for you, it means that it was not a belief for them, either. Thus, there is no them left. You have shifted out of the old state of anthropology, as well as out of the former state of history. Yes, ancient people <laughs> have, might have been entangled, as Ellen Watson has showed, brilliantly showed, but we are even more so, and on a much wider scale, and with many more entities and agencies to take into account. If there is one thing you don't believe in anymore, it's the impossibility of being emancipated, freed from all attachment, blissfully unaware of the consequences of your action, and of a modernist parenthesis, beginning or return to what? <coughs> what would be the world if we have never been modern? Second modernity, reflexive modernization, as Ulrich Beck has proposed, not modern, which is pretty awful. <laughs> Why not ordinary? <laughs> Terrien. Mortal. Anthropological. Yes, ordinary. That's the word I prefer. By stopping being modern, we have become ordinary humans again. But in what way, having stopped being modern, could possibly help us carry out our politics of controversial matters of concern? To help us for this politics of thing, the rules of which have to be written, the protocol book help. Why would it be easier now to define the new sovereign? Let me try out by using a simple but very telling example that Monsieur Chirac, my beloved president, <laughs> decided two years ago to put an end to the violent controversy of a mad cow disease and the use of powder made out of crushed bone to feed livestock. Starting that, from now on, herbivores, he said, are herbivores. <laughs> this statement is not as tautological as it sounds. <laughs> Although at first sight it sounds as a truism, a fact of nature, it's in effect a strongly political statement, since it means that Monsieur Chirac takes a stand in the controversial matter, matters of concern now, not matters of fact, of the mad cow diseases, and decides, yes, decides, about what would have been considered before as a mere matter of fact. Herbivores are herbivores and should remain so. Let us be careful here. When uttering this sentence, a president is not invoking Mother Nature's wisdom, for forbidding man to break a limit. Chirac, believe me, is a fully modernist mind, one of the few left. <laughs> a famous beef eater. And I'm sure he doesn't give a hoot for the sacred limit of nature. No, Monsieur Chirac is drawing what I would call, after John Trash, with some idea, a cosmogram. He is deciding in which world he wishes French to live. After the catastrophic collective experiment of the mad cow disease, a cosmos is redesigned, in which herbivore, yes, become herbivores again and for good, or at least as long as another cosmogram has not been redesigned. What is a cosmos? As we know from the Greek and from the word cosmetic, it means a beautiful arrangement, the opposite of which is called a cacosmos, a horrible shamble, as Plato uses the word. Politics, if I am right in my interpretation of a present, no longer resign in defining what human value should be, given that there exists one cosmos known by unified science, and simplified as one nature, but in drawing, deciding, proposing a cosmogram, a certain distribution of roles and functions, agencies to human and non-human. When uttering this sentence that looked like a factual statement, 
and a tautological one of that. Monsieur Chirac is defining at once a type of landscape for the region in which he lives, a role model for cattle raisers, a type of industry, an agro-industrial model, a pattern of consumer taste, and probably also a European Union subsidy policy. <laughs> but is this not the way political claims always have been formulated? There is nothing new in those course programs, since politics has always been about human values only, sorry, has never been simply about human values only, but always also about infrastructures, city planning, borders, landscape, ways of life, industry, etc. One telling proof of that is the beautiful fresco by Angorio Lorenzetti in Siena, Italy, the famous allegory of a good and bad government in City Hall, so beautifully commented uh, by Quentin Skinner, Skinner, does not only contrast good and wicked people, but if you remember it, harmonious and destroyed landscape, handsome and ugly housing, affluent and destitute economy. Things are everywhere mixed with people. They always have. There is, however, a huge difference in the way political claims can now be articulated around cast program and the way they were authorized before. Nature has disappeared. The great pan is dead. And so have the experts mediating between the production of science and the desire or wishes of society. By nature, I mean this unified cosmos which could shortcut political process by defining once and for all which world we have to live in. Nature, contrary to superficial philosophy, is a political animal. It is what used to define the world we have in common, the obvious existence we share, the sphere to which we all equally pertain. In addition to nature, there existed what divides us, what makes us enemy of one another, what scatters us around in a maelstrom of controversy. In other words, nature, unified up in advance and without any discussion or negotiation, culture only divide us. If only, so the modern is dream, if only we could all be children of nature, forget about our cultural, subjective, ideological, religious division, we will all be unified again. We all zoom on the same solution. More nature, hence more unity. More cultures, hence more division. We all know from our reading of the Bible the story of the Tower of Babel that has been destroyed by God, Jesus, wrath. And that from then on, people have been scattered around the world, prisoner of their differing dialects and of their incommensurable cultural biases. Yes, but who has told the terrifying story of the fall of the southern Tower of Babel? When nature, yes, nature herself, as a united endeavor which should have reached to the heaven and made all of the people of the world agree again, has been destroyed under the weight of its own ambition and lying everywhere in ruins. To multiculturalism, born in the aftermath of the first battle, one should now add the many tribes of multinaturalism, born in the wreck of the second battle. The whole political impact of nature was depending on it being one and unified and indisputably so, herbivores are herbivores. But what can you do with multiple natures? How to defend it, to invoke it? In case the first trial has remained inconclusive, here is another test to decide for yourself if you are modernist, postmodern, or ordinary mortal. Do you believe that the second tower of Babel can reach heaven and that the whole planet having been fully naturalized, we then agree rationally on all the important issues, the little division that will remain 
being only due to subjective opinions and leftover passion. A simple but very sharp, very discriminating test. Do you associate nature with a unification already completed or with even more division? in great need of a unification to be completed this time in the future. It's my sentiment that we now live in the ruins of nature, in all the sense of the world, and also more and more in the ruins of those sciences for which the last century has been so prolific, which dream of prematurely unifying the cosmos without taking the pain of doing what Isabel Stenby has called cosmopolitics. By reusing this venerable word from the Stoic, she doesn't mean that we should be attuned to the many qualities of multiculturalism and internationalism, but to the many worries of multinaturalism as well. The whole civilization that has been devised under the heading of cosmopolitanism, because it was obvious we all shared one nature, and especially one human nature, has to be reinvented this time with the added terrible difficulty that there are many competing natures and that they have to be unified for due process and agonizingly slow behavior. The common world is not behind us as a solid and undisputable ground for agreement, but before us as a risky and highly disputable goal that remains very much in the future. Some people, especially some scientists and philosophy of science, have of late been terrified when they heard the first crumbling of the second tower of Babel. <laughs> Irritated by the realization that nature could no longer unify or reconcile, that new sciences were not putting down the fires of passion but fueling them, they turned against other philosophers postmodern thinkers, science students, and other anthropologists of various views and colors. Such is the meaning for me of the Stockard affair and of what has been called by journalists the science war. Even people like me have been accused of being responsible for the breaking of a second time, <laughs> as if we were strong enough to do like Samson and destroy the pillars of established nature under our own heads. No. Can't be we should. We are not that strong, we don't have this power, and I have no taste for heroic suicide. <laughs> As to the tower, never was it that strong either. If it has crumbled it's under its own weight, under its own ambition, by expanding everywhere to cover the whole of human experience, it has lost its, it has lost its immunity, its unity, its privilege. It has become the common cause, and thus entered fully the realm of politics as usual. Here again, matters of fact have become matters of concern. When pacing among those ruins, there is nothing to be sad or nostalgic, since one of the many reasons that made politics so weak in the past, at least in the European tradition, has been this absolute distinction between, on the one hand, the sovereignty of nature, known by science, and, on the other, the pathetic effort of naked humans to put an end to their passion and divisive opinion. As long as the two towers have not been smashed to the ground, it remains very difficult to begin again and to define politics in the way I now define it as a progressive composition of the common world. As long as one of the tires remained standing, it was impossible to secularize politics for good. You always had to defend hybrid form against people coming from ranks of the social or natural sciences who claimed that elsewhere, outside, in another place, in their discipline, existed a pure and perfect assembly in the midst of which agreement could be obtained by simply behaving rationally and by gathering people in a reasonable manner around undisputable matters of fact. 
this miraculous recipe was enough to disqualify, by contrast, all of the other attempts to reach an agreement on the matters of concern. <coughs> as long as the phantom form existed, all of the others were deemed inefficient, irrational, and impure. Although at first it sounds like a negative progress only, it is for the monitoring of collective experiment a huge advantage not to be threatened again by the promise of any salvation by any science, neither physics, nor biology, nor sociology, nor economics, nor even procedural rationality. Now, at least, there is no alternative. We are embarked. We cannot hope for the transcendence of nature, for the transcendence of rationality to come and save us. If we don't discover the way for which the world can be made common, there will be no common world to share. It's as simple as that. And nature will no longer be sufficient to unify us in spite of ourselves. To sum up, I could say that when Galileo modified the classical trope of the book of nature, adding, as everyone of you know, that it was written in mathematical character, little could he anticipate that now we should have to say that the book of nature is in fact a protocol book, a huge and complex ledger that should be written in a mixture of legal, moral, political, and mathematical hierarchy. It's still a book, but how different between? It sounds as if we had witnessed not the war of the two roses, but the war of the two Johns. Everything happens as if in the long run, John Dewey had triumphed over John Locke. The second John matters of concern have swamped the first John's matters of fact. The second empiricism has swamped the first empiricism. Instead of a politics established as far as possible on nature, it should now be carefully balanced on matters of concern on the perilous notion of what Dewey has called the public. Only those who have invented the premature unification of the whole world under the aegis of an imperialist nature, are well placed, now that nature has ended its role as a shortcut of political due process, to finally pay the price of a progressive, cautious, modest, slow composition of the common world, the new name I propose for politics. The building, building of its third tile might succeed where the two others have failed, because this time, at least, there is no longer any generous God left to bring it to the ground. Politics, at last, has been fully secularized. Thank you very much.
coming to certain conclusions on all recommendations would, would rely on a spectrum of methodologies, i.e. having spoken to people, i.e. for instance focus group interviews, i.e. having tested your uh, results uh, against the people, having in those people that have to integrate the information different uh, perspectives and different experiences to that extent I think one would say you, you may perhaps uh, be at least testing the limits of the scientific, the traditional scientific domain but I, I think I'm not probably not answering your question. Are we not sure question? I one of the interesting arguments around this uh, nature of thing, I mean, the thingness, is precisely that there are as many assemblages, there are as many, sorry, there are as many assemblies as there are assemblages. But we are very familiar now in the case of ecological uh, dispute that one of the river, the round river, which is, an, which used to be a matter of fact, which is now a matter of concern, many assemblies are uh, grouped around. So that, what is so interesting and a lot of things which we can hear actually in the different uh, session here it, it's a very different question. It's not do we have access in general it's which ad hoc assembly is made around this specific assembly and I want to play on assembly and assembly because it's another way of talking about thing as outside the thing as being a code or quasi judiciary uh, form. So I, I think what the question is precisely not a general one. Uh, there are as many assemblies as there are uh, assemblages. Now I want to ask my question to Mr. Marais. Okay. You said Marais, I mean I would say the French Marais. Okay, it's French, so I say Marais. <laughs> <laughs> the Dutch of course say something else. But the Dutch pronounce the uh, Dutch name very strangely. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they say Huygens instead of Wiegers. <laughs> Amazing fact anyway. In order for us to discuss, I, I have to understand with what you didn't very spe much specify in your first line is how do you get the scientific study that a new constitution is being necessary? Because for me, the way you presented it was clearly a mixture, a hybrid form between scientific data and a political commitment, which is okay with me, but I want to understand exactly how it worked. I mean, did you did you use from first principle like John Locke did in the 17th century that given what matters of fact are, property rights is necessary and then a new constitution has to be made. I mean, in what sense is it a scientific deduction that the new constitution had to be delivered? What do you, I, I want to understand that because if not, it will be difficult to know how to navigate our way away from the science politics dispute. Uh, that's that's uh, part of the answer uh, from uh, theories of of governance theories of constitutions, for instance, uh, basic principles that uh, that one uh, would assume should be represented in such a constitution. But then going further and saying, let's look at uh, at the current one and just just look at empirical facts. Let me give you one example: the uh, the simple fact of uh, carrying an identification or. ID card. That was for the black community. This, they invented pass laws, the pass box, uh, the don't pass they called it. Uh, and by having been being stopped and not having that of that ID with you, that was not handled as an administrative transgression, but as a criminal offence, and you ran the risk of going to jail. So by just looking at what is the result of the current one, we call it a kind of empirical support and various others. Uh, analyze to what extent uh, not only do the, uh, uh, the, the, the existing and the possible new constitution apply to all the basic principles, if you like, but also say to what extent the, uh, the current one was, uh, was in actual fact Counterproductive to whatever it produces. That answer the question, although it's in, in some of the interactions. Uh, for Dr. Lutero, uh, I've tried to talk about the phenomenon that you described as uh, this global experiment uh, using a different phrase. Uh, the phrase I've tried to use is a happening, uh, the old hippie term. I mean, the, the problem with say, uh, a Patriot Act, is that nobody knows what the implications are. Uh, what, I, what I'm trying to do is ask you, I'm trying
argument about the notion that we're now involved in a global experiment, that the, the bounds of the laboratory, as it were, have been burst. Um, partly because I guess I have a certain maybe nostalgic uh, belief in the, the value that there is a value, the notion that there is a value to experimental activity of the other side, of the, of the older sort, that is the attempt to control variables so that you can establish some kind of a relationship so that you can then use that to think about what you might do in more complicated situations. So if it's if it's not the case that, um, uh, for example, that we're, we're engaging in an experiment that's on a global scale, or a, the scale one as you, you referred to it, but for example, when I think of the way that at my institution, physics is now taught by students sitting down in front of simulations of the universe I mean, it's no longer a natural science, it's a, it's a simulatory science. It, it, there's something about that, that is the one-to-one -one scale, it's a, it's a different kind of activity. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna suggest that there are no changes in the character of the experiment, but I am concerned about the rhetorical costs uh, of the, 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 the broadening that you, you suggested. I, I don't think you use the word global, by the way, because <laughs> global is another, I, I like the word happening. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm curating an exhibition in Germany uh, largely around this question uh, of what it means for, to have re-representation tools to capture the thing you, 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 you mentioned. I mean, what, what the technology of representation in all of the sense of the word I just described. And, and um, what, it's not global that interests me, it's the word public. So I'm, I'm trying to revise uh, using the word of the work of a young uh, Dutch philosopher called Norge Maes uh, Lippmann, Walter Lippmann, Phantom Public. Lippmann wrote this fabulous book in the 30s of Phantom Public, on which Dewey wrote his own book on public on his prime. And the public has this very odd characteristic of being a phantom, of being the indirect and unwanted consequence of our action of not being understood by any expert, neither the state, nor the scientist, nor the journalist, and having to be experimented. What is so nice with this tradition, which is a great American philosophical tradition of pragmatism, is that it's insisting precisely on pragmata. Pragmatism, in spite of Walt's interpretation, is about pragmata, first, thing, which is another word for thing, for matters of concern. So, I, you, we, we can be nostalgic about the first John, but it's the second one which is interesting. And I mean, the second one being John Dewey. So that, that's the line where we, it's not a global, it's a public, because even the notion of global is already like nature, supposing a global unification of which we have no proof of. So the public is the unwanted, I mean, Dewey constantly insists on that. The public is the ad hoc provisional re-representation of the unwanted consequence of our action. So the study that Professor Marais presented would be exactly the study, and of course for Dewey, social sciences was a crucial instrument of what exactly, I mean, you gave a beautiful example of pragmatism in Dewey's sense, re-representing in one study the unwanted consequences of all our action, not to say these are the matters of fact unquestionable behind what you appearance that as a way of making us explore by groping in the dark the unwanted consequences of our action. So of course we can be nostalgic about the light, the enlightenment, except it's not such a powerful light. <laughs> so, do we, for Dewey, politics is about blind leading blind. Now if you are blind, even a white king is an enormous advantage. Of course, compared to the fabulous light of reason, the cane is nothing. Yes, but if you are blind, led by blind, and God knows that we are now being led by blind, <laughs> a little cane would be a great progress. And, and I think that's so powerful in pragmatism, that the notion of experiment is that blindingly groping in the dark, if only they have a cane. <laughs> Yeah. He did the lab school. For him, the lab school was not a controlled experiment, but it was a play, a play pen, a sandbox. Experiment is the unwanted consequence of our action. That's what we always said, yeah. yeah. So
question for Bruno, but also for Dr. Murray. Uh, I wonder whether you are not excessively hopeful when you say we are going from matters of fact towards matters of concern, or we are going to become more ordinary, perhaps. Uh, it seems to me if you look, uh, at least in, in the Western tradition, on the debates on law and the foundation of ethics and so on, uh, then you have exactly the opposite. We have given up on a naturalized law for at least decades, if not centuries, but we are now going back to the hope uh, in a natural basis for uh, a law and an ethics as the only way out of the dilemma we are in. And on the other hand, if you look at some other regions of the world, and I'm thinking of terrorism and um, uh, some of these areas, then you have the impression that what happens there is that the people are holding up in the corner of culture and trying to construct the cosmos by giving up on nature completely or not recognizing it or not doing anything with it, but to try and um, design the world, to use your terminology, you know, completely out of the cultural corner of things. Um, and I was also wondering whether one need not uh, put Heidegger on its head some, on his head some. <laughs> uh, when he was talking about uh, 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 technology and science, he very often had this lamentational tone, you know, that we are losing the concern and we are losing the care and we are going into the direction of facticity. Uh, whereas you could also think that the sort of thing which nature gave us was not a unifying basis or a sort of facticity, what, what, what? was not the kind of unification you were invoking, but the facticity, the soundness of a fa factual uh, universe, but rather a task, you know, a concern, a matter uh, uh, to be dealt with, to do something with, which would allow us to bypass being completely in the corner of culture, you know, of religion, or of things of that sort. So my interpretation would be it was exactly a task before us, a future, some thing to work with, uh, which uh, nature actually gave us, and if that is lost, then you end up in a situation which is even worse than what we had in modernity. Uh, three gigantic questions, uh, Karen. So, uh, the first religious one is a natural law. We, I mean, I, I mentioned one of the perfect possibilities of the country, the extension of naturalization. I mean, it's a distant uh, possibility. I, I, I said, the controversy is about what the feeling of a present. So we, we, the problem is that it's very difficult to know what is presently happening in terms of epochal uh, sense. And, and the idea of naturalization, that naturalization is winning, uh, is perfectly possible if you read the Wall Street Journal and uh, lots of other things like that. And you know that very well from the finance, the work of finance. But law, and I've just published a book on, on doing exactly for solving this question and ethnographically on studying the law, because law is not a good case for naturalization. Law is precisely the beautiful artificial construction where pro veritate abetur, as they say, for, for the, precisely not a beautifully constructivist definition of truth. So uh, I don't think law can help the naturalizer to do their uh, dirty uh, job. The, the, the second thing, I, I mean, that's completely aside, I'm not a specialist about that, for me, terrorism is actually a fundamentalism based on the ignorance of constructivism. It's a very modernist position. Terrorism is the application of a modernist troll to uh, another situation. And actually, it's the, the I mean, it's an interpretation of the misunderstanding about constructivism, an unconstructed, unmediated, direct access to God. But that's not traditional theology, neither in Islam nor, of course, in Christianism. It's modernism. What is so horrifying is that we see modernism in the other space now, and we found that now horrible. But we were horrible too. 
with the notion of unconstructed, unmediated direct access to, uh, to, to God or to truth. So the interpretation of, I don't think we should interpret terrorism as a local cultural element. I think it's a very modernist element. But that, I'm not a specialist about this, but not important for my book. Now the last one, beautiful, and um, Sorge, I mean, the, 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 great, the great thing, precisely, I think, with what we have, we have been doing is to liberate nature from nature, so to speak, to liberate the thingness, the matters of concern, from the, hand, from the kidnapping by uh, naturalizers. Precisely to, to get back exactly what you say, I and mean, that you demonstrated so beautifully in your own work, in the attachment of scientists to their object, not emancipatory, not the emancipation argument, but not really the attachment. So, when I say nature is dead, the great hand is dead, to use uh, Nietzsche's redefinition of Greek. It, 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 it doesn't mean that it's, it, it's precisely to free again the attachment to the thing. And on that, I follow you entirely. And actually, Sloterdijk uh, made this argument that STS, the sort of thing we do when we always accuse Heidegger of being uh, the bad guy, is wrong because we would not have invented for object such an interesting role if he had not talked again about the thing in an interesting way. And of course his mistake was to say, well, things is the thing of the past and object now are sort of gestell, gegenstand type, type of thing. And, and what I think we have been doing is precisely to bring it, to get the scientific object, the thickness and thickness which the notion, the traditional notion of nature had sort of embraced, and we did the same for technology with hype. So I agree, the way I presented the argument could mean, well, if we get nature out, then we lose the sorgo, the attachment to the, uh, the matters of concern. But that's precisely what the word pragmata, the word issue, the word matters of concern, or concern, mean. But I thank you for this clarification. The second point we deserve all meaning, actually, because it's a very interesting where modernism now go. Modernism goes a very strange place now, including for the modernism. Mark, do you want to react to this point as well? Then there's one last question. Um, yes, please. And then we can wrap up. Yes, that's a question for Mr. Latou. Um, I was thinking about the sovereign uh, that is the executive power, because the modernist settlement had its own sort of fixed idea of sovereignty. But um, now I guess that you would say that you have an infinite number of sovereignties in all these assemblies. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because it's like, I mean, how do we recognize a sovereign when we see one? How do we know that this is actually the assembly, the assembly to count on and not the other one? <laughs> That's a nice uh, question. Um, you want to answer that one? <laughs> About political, uh, it's very, but your question has a negative answer in political ecology, where, where clearly the idea of uh, reusing nature as a way of attacking bad politics, so to speak, was clearly a misuse of the notion of sovereign, because you use the sovereignty of nature in order to, to quiet down, so to speak, quickly, to shortcut what is a very expression political uh, process. And if you want to undo that, you have to raise again the question of sovereignty, like we and Sani. Now, my, my argument so far, and I cannot proceed further uh, now, uh, because it's only negative, is, is to say, yes, it's difficult to locate sovereignty, but it was worse when the heart of sovereignty was in the accusation of irrationality. Because if you can have the accusation of irrationality to someone, then you don't have to compose the assembly in the political process. But that's actually on, only a negative argument. Uh, actually, if I can do some publicity for Harvard University Press, the translation of politics of nature where, where this argument is articulated would soon be out of university. Sorry for this. <coughs> but the question of sovereignty is crucial, and it's precisely because we abandon it with the notion of ecology, with the notion of uh, Gaia, 
that political ecology has always been politically weak. You can't have political opposition without defining the sovereign. I mean, that's an obvious question. But if the sovereign, if you can, if you can, with the accusation of irrationality, avoid the assembly, then you lose the political uh, edge. But I agree, in this talk, my argument was only negative. I'm very sorry that I have to call an end to this meeting because you were fully um, thrive to go to the business meeting in half an hour and, and if not that, then to the banquet at 7 o'clock. Thank both speakers very much for their comments. Now record right. Maybe she should stop us in the entrance, huh? Eh? Well no, we'll just let's say we'll just do a little pan. People now sort of sitting down. To the back of Harry's head. And then I stopped.